We've been discussing a lot about plane waves and most of the models in the books are built on plane waves, but real sound fields are not made of plane waves, they're more complicated than that. And their fundamental ingredients is actually spherical sources, also called acoustic monopoles. So let's first look at how we can extract from uh, the wave equation spherical solutions uh, and, and see what we can say about them from an acoustical point of view. So the wave equation takes the form of a Laplace operator delta applied to the pressure signal p minus 1 over c squared d2p over dt squared, we've seen that before. But we want here to write uh, the same equation in spherical coordinates. And in spherical coordinates, the Laplace operator takes on a complex form involving derivatives with respect to r, which I'm writing now, plus terms involving derivatives with respect with the two angles theta and phi. And these two derivatives we can uh, forget about here because we are looking for a spherically symmetric uh, equation. The first term can be developed, um, 1 over r squared, the derivative with respect to r of the product is developed, and we end up with an expression 2 over r dp dr plus d2p over dr uh, square. But we can in fact write the same first term in a different way. We can write it as 1 over r, the second derivative of the product p times r with respect to r square. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate that this is the case by developing this first, uh, first term. So it's 1 over r, derivative with respect to r of uh, r dp dr plus p, and then I take again the derivative to obtain 2 dp dr plus uh, r d2p dr square. Um, so again it gives 2 r, 2 over r dp dr plus d2p over dr square, and you see that uh, these two ways of writing the first terms are identical. So that the uh, wave equation can be written as in spherical coordinates as 1 over r, second derivative of pr with respect to r square minus 1 over c square d2p dt square, and this is still equal to 0. And if I now multiply that by r, I get d2pr over dr square minus 1 over c square d2pr over dt square which is equal to zero. And that's nothing but the d'Alembert equation for the unknown pressure times displacement. And therefore, the d'Alembert solution applies for PR. PR is any function of time minus R over C plus another function G of time plus R over C. So that the pressure in spherical, uh, for spherically symmetric solution is 1 over r f of t minus r over c plus 1 over r g of t plus r over c. So a general solution to the uh, wave equation in spherical coordinates is 1 over r times of any function of t minus r over c plus 1 over r times any function of time plus uh, rho c and it should be a plus here. Um, but if we go to the frequency domain, ft minus r over c give us f omega exponential minus ikr, and the second terms give us g omega exponential ikr. Normally, I can uh, consider uh, the two. I have to consider the two terms, and in plane waves, I've done so. But here, in practice, uh, only diverging solutions exist. It's hard to imagine a solution where spherical waves would uh, converge towards the center. Now we have the pressure, we have to calculate the velocity using the expression vr is equal to i over rho omega times the derivative with respect to r of exponential minus ikr over r. So it's just a matter of calculating the derivative of the quotient of the division of two uh, functions and I see that the term f omega exponential minus ikr over r can be placed as factors, and uh, I obtain uh, the following uh, expression and the calculation is, is, is developed. Uh, it's the end result that is interesting. You see that the velocity is the pressure f omega 
divided by rho c times exponential minus i k r over r, which is what we would have uh, for a plane wave, but multiplied by a factor 1 plus 1 over i k r, which is the main difference with the uh, plane wave velocity distribution. And the impedance is, so the ratio of pressure to velocity, is rho c divided by 1 plus 1 over i k r, and I will comment on that result later. The intensity is one half times the uh, real part of the pressure times the complex conjugate of the velocity, and if I uh, develop that, I see that the complex exponential uh, will vanish, that f and f star will give me a, a modulus of f squared, and that the uh, complex term 1 plus 1 over i k r uh, does not uh, come in because we take the real part uh, of, of that. So we take the real part and therefore what remains for the intensity is f omega square divided by uh, 2 rho c r square and that's the main difference. So how can we analyze this solution that we just obtained? Let's look at the pressure distribution as a function of distance. Of course, we see two things. We have a wavy character that comes from the complex exponential, so we have a real part and an imaginary part. They are both oscillating, one like a cosine function, the other one like a sine function. But here we have the 1 over r term that we have to take into account. And you see that the real part, cosine kr over r, tends to infinity when r tends to zero, while the imaginary part, uh, sine kr over r, remains finite because it's a sinc function and the limit when r tends to zero of sine kr over r is equal to, uh, to 1. So, um, and of course the amplitude, because we have a sine and a cosine term that adds together, the envelope, let's say the amplitude of the pressure just decays in uh, 1 over r. So in this first picture we have taken k equal to 1. If we increase the frequency we get a different pressure distribution which is uh, this one. Now we also may look at the impedance. The impedance has a very important, interesting variation. Again, it has a real part and an imaginary part. And what I'm showing here is not the, the impedance, but the reduced impedance, Z divided by rho C. And so we see it's just equal to one over one plus one over i k r. It may seem like a complex way of writing it, but you will see later on in the course that it is very appropriate to write uh, things like that in a polynomial. Here it's a first order polynomial of one over i k r. And again, you have a real part and an imaginary part. Let's look at the real part first. You see that it starts at zero when r is equal to zero and then it grows progressively until it reaches the value of one. So asymptotically when the distance is important the real part of the impedance is equal to rho c which is the impedance of plane waves. So that confirms once again that uh, plane waves are nothing else than spherical waves seen from far away. And the imaginary part starts by growing, reaches a maximum uh, and then starts decaying and asymptotically it tends to uh, zero. So we see conceptually that we have two regions in the neighborhood of a, of a source and we'll come back to that when we talk about sound radiation later on. Uh, you see that close to the source uh, things are complicated. You have a real part and an imaginary part for the impedance. Uh, we call that the near field of the source and it is traditionally defined as the dis uh, anything that is less than five wavelengths away from the source. And then you see that we have the far field and in the far field things are more simple. The imaginary part of the impedance is reduced so the reactive part of intensity is reduced and you have essentially um, um, active intensity radiating away from uh, the body. So at the level of a, a spherical source it's not yet 
really important and meaningful, but you'll see later on that this concept of near field and far field is important in acoustics and it was maybe a good time to uh, introduce it.